In the second half of the 19th century, La Crosse was home to a bustling community. At the time, La Crosse was a pioneer town that supported a diverse population of migrants and immigrants of European descent, black American refugees and exiles who fled the South, as well as an undocumented number of Ho-Chunk. While the focus of research on early La Crosse history has often been white pioneer settlers, today we can learn about some of our community's historic black residents. Some of these residents were foundational in our community. Some changed the course of national history. We're able to study these people because of primary sources and dedicated historians. For example, most of this history has come to light thanks to the diligent work of historian Bruce Mauser and UWL Special Collections librarian Edwin Hill, who together spent decades collecting information on La Crosse's black history. Eventually, Mauser compiled his research and published a book called Black La Crosse, Wisconsin, 1850-1906, Settlers, Entrepreneurs, and Exodusters. Mauser used primary sources to prove that hundreds of black residents lived in La Crosse in the 19th century. He tracked families and individuals in sources like state and federal census records, city directories, newspapers, and tax records. His book, Black La Crosse, allows us to read through what the daily lives look like for many of these residents, how and why they came to La Crosse, where they lived in the city, where they worked, and what their community and family relationships looked like. Thanks to the groundbreaking primary research completed by Mauser and other researchers, we are now able to celebrate many of the real life people through history programs like the Enduring Families Project. The La Crosse Public Library Archives and Local History Department holds and makes accessible many of the primary sources that enables this research of local black history. Archivists at the Public Library collect and preserve these resources to help further our community's education. In this video, we will help contextualize the intersectional and real lives of the people portrayed by the Enduring Families Project. First, let's begin with an overview of the migration of colonists to the area. What is now called the city of La Crosse occupies land that was once a prairie that was home to a band of Ho-Chunk. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act in an attempt to forcibly and often violently remove indigenous peoples from their ancestral lands. Throughout the 1830s and 1840s, the federal government conducted a series of six attempts to forcibly remove local Ho-Chunk by steamboat to reservations west of the Mississippi River. However, many of La Crosse's Ho-Chunk found their way back to their homeland and eventually the federal and local governments moved on to new strategies to eradicate indigenous folks and culture from the newly established United States of America. Mauser argued that in 1848, the last formal removal of the Ho-Chunk people marked the transition of La Crosse from a fur trading village to a frontier community. La Crosse was incorporated as a city not even 10 years later in 1856. Early colonizers in La Crosse, black and white alike, were attracted to the area for a number of reasons. In the mid-1800s, La Crosse was a wide open sand prairie, flat with few trees and just barely above the flood line. To the colonizers arriving, it was perfect for development. The shape of the river near what is today Riverside Park also provided a natural harbor which helped shape La Crosse as a major shipping center. As a prominent upper Mississippi River town, La Crosse was a convenient location on the heavily trafficked riverway. People arrived in La Crosse on a steamboat at first and later in the 1860s by railway. For a time, La Crosse sported the nickname Gateway City because it was the last stop on the railroad before crossing the Mississippi into the Great West. La Crosse was a place for opportunity and cheap land which made it the third largest city in the state for many decades in Wisconsin's history. Black American refugees fleeing the South were drawn to La Crosse for the same reasons that white settlers were. It was a relatively easy western city to travel to and had promise for unskilled laborers looking for industrial jobs as well as entrepreneurs looking for inexpensive property to start their business. 
By looking at the data collected by Mauser, it is easy to see that many black residents in the 1800s came to La Crosse to settle with other family members, sometimes even working in the same trade and living together in the same house or on the same street. Other black settlers came to La Crosse for guaranteed employment thanks to networking they did in southern states during the Civil War. For example, one prominent settler, Nathan Smith, worked for General Cadwallader Washburn during the Civil War. When Washburn came back to La Crosse after the war, Nathan Smith came with him. In this way, when black migrants arrived in La Crosse, it wasn't rare for them to already have a job lined up. As a barber apprentice in their in-law's shop or working as a valet for a wealthy white family on Cass Street. Others found jobs working in hotels, restaurants, large homes, or barbershops. This kind of service work was the most common for black Americans in La Crosse. Of course, there was plenty of labor or work that didn't require many skills, but paid solid wages in the railroad and shipping industries. One historic photograph shows men building a road in La Crosse, and a number of black men can be seen in the group. Other black settlers were prominent entrepreneurs. The Moss family was well-renowned for owning and operating one of the best barber shops in town. John Burney was another popular barber, who was also a land speculator. His daughters were at the top of their school class and were expected to go far by their teachers. Most of La Crosse's black residents of the time clustered in a few neighborhoods around the city. Because of the nature of the service and shipping industry, many found themselves living near their work in La Crosse's downtown. Others, who worked as domestics for wealthy estates, often lived in the servant quarters or the carriage houses of the families who employed them. One example is the Pogue family, who lived on the Easton estate for many years. George Coleman Pogue utilized the same library in the home as the Easton children, and even tutored them in the French and German languages. Other black residents lived in the 1000 block of Pine and Vine Streets. The North Side was also a popular neighborhood. Mill Street, which is now Copeland Avenue, was home to a number of black families. Some black migrants chose to make their homes on farms and in rural settlements. One of Wisconsin's largest rural black settlements was in the Cheyenne Valley near Hillsboro, not far from La Crosse. Mauser's book, Black Lacrosse, spanned the years 1850 to 1906, because in the second half of the 19th century, Lacrosse supported a 1-2% to black population. However, by 1910, this number had dropped to 0.002%, and it stayed below 1% for the next 90 years, until the 2000 census. This is a common story for many Wisconsin and Midwest communities. Mauser explained this population disparity as the outcome of the economic depression that came to La Crosse in the 1890s, after the lumber boom had crashed, leaving La Crosse scrambling to redefine its industrial identity to fix the general unemployment issue. Mauser theorized that if white working class residents couldn't find jobs, how were black Americans supposed to find jobs? He recognized that they faced discrimination in La Crosse, but did not attribute this as to why many migrated to other cities. Other historians contextualize this by looking at the nation as a whole. The period between the 1890s and early 1900s is characterized as the nadir, or the lowest point in American race relations, and the period of the most active anti-black racism and legal racial discrimination since the Civil War. This was marked by the establishment of the Jim Crow laws, an increase in racial motivated lynchings, and escalated segregation throughout the US and not just in the South. The Nader was only encouraged by white politicians in power who realized that they were losing votes by advocating for racial equality, which had been a platform topic in the post-Civil War society. An attempt to appease their white voter base these politicians made the choice to abandon race issues and black politicians. One black politician who watched this happen was Socrosis George Edwin Taylor, who ran for presidency in 1904 to demonstrate to the white politicians that the black voter base was something to attract and consider in their platforms rather than to abandon. 
The increase in anti-black discrimination strategies applied to many towns and cities in Wisconsin, including La Crosse. La Crosse enabled anti-black racism in the 20th century, which can be seen in instances of landlords not renting to black Americans, cemeteries having all-white clauses, newspapers using derogatory language, and stores hanging whites-only signs. There is evidence of these examples and primary sources held in our local archives. By 1980, La Crosse's population demographics began to change, with Hmong and Cuban refugees settling in the area. Black Americans began settling in La Crosse around this time too, and according to the recent census data, La Crosse supports a 2.5% black population today. Of course, all history is complicated and nuanced, and it deserves more attention than this short summary. If you're interested in this, please explore the hundreds of resources available at your local library to learn more about the Jim Crow era and race relations in the 20th century U.S. Today, we can study and learn about this history through various lenses and embrace many legacies, whether that means repairing the rooted systemic racism in our local institutions or celebrating a number of black residents in our community's past and present. The Enduring Families Project gives us a glimpse into the extraordinary lives of some of these historic black voices and shares their meaningful contributions to our community's history.